An actress named Emma Dumont, who you might have recognized from Oppenheimer, recently came out as non-binary transmasculine. Um, I did want to. I did pull up a definition of it because I was just curious how the. How well, I I knew it, what know. non-binary meant. It just means that your gender falls off of the male female binary, but transmasculine says, just means that you're female and you like to identify or express masculinity without identifying as male. Yeah, it says denoting or relating to a person who has registered as female at birth, but whose gender identity is in some way aligned with or characterized by masculinity. So that just means you're a girl who likes wearing backwards snap snapbacks and um, I don't know, wearing sports bras. Yeah, but then the, that's yeah. You just like to look somewhat I mean, masculine. Didn't we just call this a tomboy back in the day. And that no, that that actually just means that you're trans. Oh, that's what that means now. Okay. So um, TMZ was the first to report this news, this major revelation. Emma Dumont reveals they are non-binary, and friends and family are calling them by a new name. The Oppenheimer star changed pronouns and name on their Instagram bio recently, writing that they now go by they, them pronouns instead of she, her. And uh, rep for Emma Dumont tells TMZ, they identify as a transmasculine non-binary person. Mm. Their work name is still going to be Emma Dumont, but they'll go by Nick with friends and family. So Emma Dumont so it's a stage name. is a stage name and Nick is the friends and family name. Dumont's career has taken off in recent years, scoring major roles in Licorice Pizza, uh, Marvel TV series The Gifted, and Oppenheimer. But I did see someone immediately make the joke, this is what you do when you haven't gotten a new acting gig in over a year. Yeah. Um... They're like... I'm non-binary mm. now. Give me a job. She did Oppenheimer <laughs> in 2023, and then she narrated a video called Bloody November in 2024, and that's the only thing. She's got one thing mm -hmm. upcoming. Um, but that's not the route that you should go if you're looking for more work, because take a look at the drop in Elliot Page's career since she's coming out movie. as trans. She's got a new movie coming out right now. Um, about uh, it's about being trans. Yeah, it's, uh, like that's it? my point. You can't really work in mainstream Hollywood anymore after you do this. Uh, it starts to pigeonhole you amongst those roles. It's a point of no return. My worry is that Emma Dumont is going to be sort of the next Elliot Page in Hollywood. Maybe, yeah. Someone who once was. I a, mean, but without the pedigree that. Elliot Page sure, had yeah. built as Ellen Page long before that with Juno and But I just mean like this is this is a naturally gorgeous feminine looking actress who decides to erase all of that, anathematize everything feminine about themselves, yeah. go by a new name and cut off all your hair and put on this new persona when you come out yes. and live your true self and it's actually just disturbing to watch but why do you do it why why do you do something like this it's so that you can become a more interesting person if you associate yourself with this movement it just makes you more interesting uh this was echoed by an actress annette benning mm -hmm. in dc recently saying to have a transgender child has made me so much more interesting let's listen to this hmm. yeah. you're saying the quiet part out loud i think the greatest gift of my life is to have kids and to have a transgender child has made me so much more interesting <laughs> so much more wise <laughs> and for the supreme court justices i encourage them to talk to their kids, their grandkids, their nieces and nephews, because I'll bet if they really sit down and ask them, do you know trans kids around you? Do you have any non-binary friends? They're gonna say yes. 
and they're going to say that this is part of the beautiful rainbow of human beings everywhere. Okay. Reminds me of uh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard's mom. She probably thought that having a daughter in a wheelchair made her very interesting and wise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and virtuous, um, didn't she? Those are two. And the funny thing is, these are two separate arguments. The what Annette Banning is talking about versus what Emma Dumont is doing. Because for Emma Dumont, it's all connected to her marketability and her profession. Thank you. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. Thank you, guys. Eating the cats. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. Eating the cats. With Emma Dumont, it's, uh, at least in her mind, I have to imagine if she believes that it's beneficial to her career to do this. I, I can't know her heart or her logic or, or how she feels, but it's an industry where increasingly it doesn't add uh, much for sincerity when it became so fashionable a couple of years ago to hire people in certain roles that fit this. So, you know, it makes it hard to buy the genuine nature of all this, but... I don't know. My assumption is totally different based on what I've observed from Elliot Page mm -hmm. and what she has written about her identity and her experience with coming out and being her true self or whatever. Um, obviously, Elliot Page had some very traumatic experiences in her industry. Yeah. And they're probably stories that we're never going to hear talked about openly mm. but you can only assume based on what we know about just a name like harvey weinstein for instance it's not uncommon for things like that to happen mm -hmm. and worse so i assumed that that was more of a trauma response and i would assume the same thing when it's a different actress as well so you you, you assume the same of emma dumont yeah mm. but you know i could be wrong uh I want to know what you think of adding this to the storyline of a show, though. Um, like because not them, but just in general, uh, in reference yeah. to the... In the second season yeah. of Squid Game, they wrote the role of a transgender woman in the series who joins Squid Game to fund her gender-affirming surgery. Um, look... I'm selfishly someone who hates who hates any type of modernity creeping into any story. Um, I prefer my storylines to be parked firmly between the years of 2002 and 2015, and anything past that, I don't care. Um, I hated when they added COVID into movie and television stories. I despised it. Mm -hmm. I hated seeing masks on TV shows. I hated seeing it written into into shows. It actually like it would it was the fastest way to get me to turn something off. I want storylines to feel timeless. On the other hand, for something like this, um, the audience. Uh, I don't know what the audience breakdown age wise is of this show. But if you're not somebody in alt media who reads about this stuff all day long, as long as it um, ends up being kind of an ancillary detail, uh, it just seems like an unnecessary risk for something with not a lot of payoff. Like you could probably do that story unbelievably well if it was the whole point of the show, and but then it wouldn't be something that I'd be interested in anyways. But something like this, when it's just kind of like a secondary detail to a character, feels very ham-fisted. Yeah. Whereas if you're going to make, tell this story, it feels like it should be the whole story or the whole season the whole season yeah. right so to me it feels like somebody needed to fill in a backstory for a character and then yeah. they're like oh we'll do that which to me that checks days, a box because it checks a box because it's what's hip right now look the to to be fair the shows that i love from an earlier time period did that as well with certain storylines i've been talking a lot about watching old procedurals and seeing all the storylines around uh, Occupy Wall Street, right? It checked a box at the time, like, mm -hmm. what's in the news right now? Certainly Law & Order has done ripped from the headline stories for decades, but all of that was before society became as polarized as it is now and before everyone was on their phone 24-7 with access to the internet. I also think that writers back then, because they weren't terminally online, probably had a more nuanced and deft approach to writing stories like that, which is just gone these days. Mm -hmm. How that turns out in this, I have no idea. Well, most of the Westerners reacting to this information were offended that they didn't actually find a transgender mm -hmm. actress 
to play the transgender character in question in Squid Game. Which uh, see, is another reason to not another reason face. to not do this story, right? Yes. Because when you create this story, you create a bunch of social hurdles that your show now has to to you know gallop mm -hmm. over just to get it made all for a storyline that's not gonna move the needle for the season anyways. Not to mention that this is a Korean show and Korean culture is far less comfortable with gender ideology than we are here in the West. Yeah. So they're pushing a boundary that does not need to be pushed and attracting controversy that they don't need. It's not convincing anyone new to give this show a chance. Mm -hmm. And more than that, it actually proves the point that, you know, if you transition as an established actor in Hollywood, it doesn't improve your chances of getting roles. Mm -hmm. It actually does pigeonhole you. And that's what ha what happened to Elliot Page. Yeah. After forcing the showrunners of Umbrella Academy to transition her character in the show. They're like, crap, I got to write this. People don't want that amount of homework when they hire you. Yeah. It's just, it's asking too much of them. It's asking too much of the casting directors. It's asking too much of the audience to suspend their disbelief. And it, after all, does not make you any more of an interesting person. It is actually just sad to watch. Uh, hold on. What? I was just curious. 80, I, yeah, I was right about this. 81% of American casting directors are women. Um, oh. So that was something that I... I wonder I was, why. Um, uh, why is that? I mean, that? it was always higher, but it was... I didn't think it was ever that high. But I know that casting directors... Whenever I would watch, like, any of the shows that I would watch and they would have the behind-the-scenes featurettes, anytime they would have interviews with casting directors, I feel like everyone I ever saw was a woman. So hmm. um, it was something that I instinctually knew but didn't have deep, you know... But it's not really on. the stereotype of the sleazy casting couch guy. No, 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 with no. With the clipboard. I mean, for, for like, big budget or for like network television it's more about like uh, look if you watch any tv show from like 2000 the 2000s through now there's like 50 or 60 actors that are really really good that you're gonna see all the time on all the shows it also makes it easier to know when they're the bad guy if you're watching some type of crime procedural because it's like if it's the one guy who's better known than the rest of them it's like mm -hmm. he's probably plays a more integral role than maybe is perhaps mentioned earlier on but there's uh there was like a season six um casting feature at about the show house where basically the show had become so popular at that time that they just had a checklist of actors they wanted to work with and now because the show is so popular they're like you 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 i want to work with you i want to work with you i want to work with you and uh, a lot of them in all of those casting directors were women in that season so but maybe that plays a role in it too is that uh if women are the majority of the casting directors that maybe they see this as a more plausible path forward whereas a male casting director is like look i don't want the hassle They're more pragmatic i don't yeah. want the hassle they're maybe they think farther ahead you know to their own detriment or not you know uh if one is focused on the story and the other one's just focused on like what's the marketing going to be like for this and what's it going to be like to to get over the hurdles in post-production like maybe the maybe there's a more of a pragmatism to certain aspects of it that's going to become more popular now because they're just not going to want to deal with it. Well, with an exception of someone like Ezra Miller, I've noticed it's mostly the women in Hollywood who are gravitating towards this non-binary yeah. identity. And I and do some of them make it more of an obstacle than others. Obviously, Bella Ramsey uh, from The Last of Us. She identifies as non-binary. She plays a female character with no issue. Yeah. Or Emma D'Arcy, I believe. Yeah. She's in House of the Dragon, identifies as non-binary, but plays a woman in the show. Go and watch the video that Greg Owen did. It was a couple of days ago called uh, uh, Why DEI is Failing Hollywood. It's about luxury beliefs. And it's a lot of it has to or, do with stuff like that. It's really, really I good. could be totally confusing Emma D'Arcy with... Emma Corrin. No, uh, maybe both. No, Emma. But they Darcy's both right. identify yeah. as non binary. Yeah. Okay, this is just too much. So, Emma Darcy, Emma Corrin, and Emma Dumont all are actresses of about the same level of notoriety that Emma identify Roberts as non binary. Run. Emma Roberts, run! Like, I just don't, I don't want them to claim any more Emmas. Just stay away from them. Stay
Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye, guys.